Now, this, is a, this is a great chapter, and one of the verses that jumped out at me just as we were reading it was uh, kind of had to do with this morning's sermon where he said in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It has to do with what I was preaching this morning about Thanksgiving coming up this week, being thankful. And uh, look at verse 10, though. The Bible says in verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving what I like the short verse in the Bible that is succinct. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now, unfortunately, what we consider acceptable, what we consider right, and what God considers acceptable, are often two very, very different things. And by the way, our, our society is not getting better, it's getting worse. Okay? God told us that the evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. We're on a downward spiral in America, we're on a downward spiral in the world. And as the world gets further and further from what God preaches in the Bible, more and more of what the world considers acceptable is going to be condemned by the Bible. Because of the fact that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so as the world changes and changes and changes, Jesus stays the same, the Bible stays the same, God stays the same, His Word stays the same, there's a bigger and bigger gap between what a real Bible preacher preaches and what the Bible says and what the world thinks about it and what the world considers acceptable. Now what I want to preach about tonight is actually the latter part of the chapter which talks about marriage. It talks about husbands and wives and how to have a good marriage. Now some of you guys are probably just thinking, well, I would just love to be married. You know, let alone have a good marriage. I just want to have a marriage, okay? And, you know, the Bible says, you know, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell you guys, but, you know, just work harder, I guess. But I want to talk about this tonight because one day you will be married and you'll want to know how to have that good marriage. Or, uh, you know, young ladies that uh, someday will be married and, and need to know these things, even my children. And then those of us that are already married. You know, we can use these things and we need this preaching to help us have a marriage that's acceptable to God, that pleases God. And let me tell you something. It's not what the marriage seminar out there probably has to tell you from the world. They're probably going to tell you the opposite of what the Bible is going to tell you. And I'm not preaching my opinion tonight. I'm preaching Ephesians chapter 5 and other places in the Bible. Let's start, in the, let's start where God starts. He says in verse 22, this is where it gets on the subject of marriage. He says, wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, what does the word submit mean? Does anybody have any idea what the word sub means? Have you ever heard of a submarine? Think about it. Uh, submission is basically putting yourself under someone else's authority. That's what it is. Sub means under. And it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, stop and think about this. If God here is telling us that the way the wife submits to their husband should be equivalent to the way that the church is subject unto Christ, he said that twice. Now, that's a pretty strong statement, because as far as I know, I mean, if you came to church tonight, you probably expect the church to be subject to Christ, not Pastor Anderson's opinion. I mean, to what extent should we let Christ be the authority in our church? To what extent should the Bible determine what we believe, what we preach, what we do? You say, well, Pastor Anderson, the Bible is the sole authority of all matters of faith and practice. You'd say, if this is a Baptist church, of course, the Bible, God's Word, Jesus Christ would be the authority, not a man. Not the pastor, not some other pastor in another city, not some pope or some president or some apostle, or, you know, they have the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, they have the Archbishop of Canterbury, they have the pope in Rome, they have this uh, prophet and this deacon. No, the Bible teaches that Christ is the head of the church, and you say, Pastor Anderson, everything we believe needs to be determined by Jesus Christ in the Bible. But wait a minute, if the church is subject unto Christ, the Bible says, even so... Let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now you say, oh man, I can't believe that. I don't, I don't agree with that. Then you don't believe the Bible. Why are you in a Baptist church if you don't believe the Bible? If you think that wives should not submit to their husbands, if you don't think that a wife has to be subject to her husband and everything, why do you even believe the Bible if you don't believe Ephesians 5? If you don't believe Ephesians 5, why don't you, why don't you why even believe John 3.16? 
Because it's the same Bible. And you say, oh, but that flies in the face of everything that the world says. Yes, and the world is wicked and the world's wrong, but the truth of the Lord endureth forever. And so you can, you can like it or lump it. This is what the Bible teaches. He says in verse number uh, 23, he said, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. You say, Pastor Harrison, that's not the formula for a good marriage. What is the formula for a good marriage? What the world has with their 75% divorce rate? Is that the way to have a good marriage? Is it the way where the world says, where, where mom goes to work and dad goes to work, and dad's flirting with this secretary, and mom's flirting with this guy on the job, and they see each other uh, at the end of the day, and they split the chores, and they split the bills, and they have separate bank accounts? Look, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what's normal. I don't care what the American way is. I care what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says there's a leader in the home, and that's the man. It's the man. Now, people will say, well, you know, you're saying that men are better than women. That's not what I'm saying. I believe that men and women are equal. I believe that God said that in Christ there's neither male nor female, neither bond nor free. It's not that one is better than the other. It's two different functions that God created, and God created the man to be an authority according to the Bible, and God put the woman under the man's authority. Not that one is better than the other, it's just different roles. I mean, am I better than you because I'm the pastor of the church? No. But I am the pastor of the church. I have authority in the church, but does that make me better than you? No. Your boss may not be better than you, but he's your boss at work. I'm talking about when you go to the job. Let's say you know more about the job than your boss does. He's still the boss because of that authority. It's not a question of who's better or worse. Think about this. You have a dishwasher and a washing machine in your house. Which one's better? Well, one of them's better at washing the clothing, and one of them's better at washing the dishes. Okay, And it has nothing to do with which one's better. They have a different function. And according to God here, in order to have a marriage that pleases God, the wife is subject unto the husband. You can't have this two-headed monster where you got two different opinions going two different directions. There has to be one leader. And that is the man according to the Bible. Look at verse number 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So here we see the flip side. So the first thing he says is, let me just lay this down, the wife is to be subject unto her husband's authority in everything. Just as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. It's the same parallel authority. And then he said, but wait a minute, as the husband, your job is to love your wife, and just as the church is subject to Christ, that authority... You're to have an, as much love for your wife as Christ had for the church. So that's pretty extreme, too. Because one of them, you say, well, that's kind of extreme. That a wife is supposed to obey their husband and submit to their husband. But then you turn the flip side, and the husband is supposed to have as much love for his wife. And he's supposed to be so self-sacrificing to his wife, just as much as Christ was for the church. I should be willing to lay down my life for my wife. I should love her so much that I'm going to give of myself. I'm going to uh, nourish her, it says in verse 29. Cherish her, even as the Lord the church. Now keep your finger here and look over at Colossians. This is just a few pages to the right in your Bible. Look at Colossians chapter number uh, 3. And Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5 are kind of parallel passages where Paul is pretty much uh, preaching about the same thing. Of course, it's God's work as all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine. But look at uh, Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 18. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And then it says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Okay? Now, think about this. What did Jesus Christ do for us when he died on the cross? Because he said, in the same way that Jesus gave himself for us, he said, that's how we should be toward our wives. And in the same way that we're supposed to obey Christ, the wife is supposed to obey her husband. This marriage is basically a picture 
of the relationship between Christ and the church. That's what it signifies. Okay, That's the picture. When we get married, that's the picture of Jesus Christ and the church. It's symbolic. And so basically, if you look at what Jesus Christ did when he came to this earth, he was beaten, he was spat upon, he was whipped, he was mocked, he was made fun of, he was abused. And if you remember, when he hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I mean, these are the people that had spat in his face, buffeted him, whipped him, made fun of him, rebuked him. And he could have called, you know, upon, you know, I think he says six score legions of angels. He said, I could call upon these angels to come and, and set me free. But he said, how then should the scripture be fulfilled? He had so much love that he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And when he was on that cross, he had nothing but love and forgiveness for those for whom he was dying. Even the one who nailed him to the cross, who may have even gotten saved, because he did say when it was all said and done, truly this was the Son of God. I believe that he believed on Jesus Christ at that time. When he acknowledged him as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And so, as husbands, what, what character do you think we should have more than any other character as a husband. Now you say love, but wait a minute, how did God show his love? By forgiving. See, that's why it says here, it says, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You see, bitterness is when you can't let things go. It's when you can't forgive. You know, somebody does something wrong and you can't move on from that and it just eats away at you. You become bitter, you become mad, you hold a grudge, you harbor feelings. Now, wait a minute, if Jesus Christ could forgive us of all our sins, can't we forgive our, our brother and sister in Christ? And even so much more, as a husband, can't we forgive our wife if she said something wrong? If, even if she said something horrible to us. They said horrible things to Jesus, and he loved, he forgave. They said things to, to Jesus Christ, they, they spat upon him, they beat him. Now, if your wife beats you up and spits on you, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, if she did, be not bitter about it. But anyway, the, the point is that if Jesus Christ had this supreme love as evidenced by his forgiveness, where he said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. That's the love he's commanding us to have. That's why he's telling us, be not bitter against them. Hey, when you wake up in the morning, when God caused the sun to rise on a new day, you need to have all bitterness put apart because he said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You shouldn't be mad today about something that happened yesterday. And let me tell you something. If I could give you the best advice for your marriage... And, and probably if I could just tell people one thing to have a good marriage is you must let things go. You must forgive. You cannot have a good marriage without forgiveness. Because think about it. You're a sinner as a man. You're a sinner as a woman. And let me tell you something. There are going to be bad things that both of you do. You're both going to do things wrong. You're both going to say things that you don't mean. You're both going to say rude or harsh things from time to time. You're both going to be selfish. You're both going to commit sin. And I'm going to tell you something, if you hold a grudge about everything that your spouse does wrong, you will never be able to have a good marriage. Because think about it, I've been married for over nine years. Well, think about how many probably times that I've offended my wife in those nine years. And then think about all the times that she's probably offended me in those nine years. Well, what if I was still mad about every wrong thing she said or done for the last nine years? And if she's still mad at me and holding a grudge for every wrong thing that I've done in the last nine odd years... Do you think we're ever going to be able to get along or have any kind of love in that relationship or any kind of a, a, a bond or, or a, a friendship that God expects us to have as a married couple? Absolutely not. And that's why we have to have this character of Christ's love where we can forgive and let things go and every day is a new start. That's why he said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Because that's what's going to drive the biggest wedge in marriage. If there's one thing that you must know, is just let things go. Just drop it. Just forget. I mean, you had a big fight on Tuesday. It shouldn't affect Wednesday. You said, Pastor Ramsey, you having a fight? When I get married, I'm just never going to have a fight. Right. You've never been married before. Yeah, that's obvious. Oh, man, I'll never, you know, we'll never. And people say, like, oh, yeah, you know, never fight. Look, everybody who's married has a fight. Face it. You know, and, and, and say, oh, I would say that. You know, never fight. Wait a minute. A lot of people, the problem is they go into marriage with an unreasonable expectation. And then when the fight happens, oh, no, we're not compatible. You know, even though they swore to God, till death do us part, for better, for worse. And they said, you know, to have and to hold from this day forward, 
till death do us part. And then they say, oh, we're not compatible because we had this big fight. Now go into it with a real expectation. It's not like the rock and roll song that you heard, where you just saw each other and it was da 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 da, and you saw each other and everything was perfect and, and you just know oh, this is perfect and wonderful and, and I only live for your happiness and blah blah blah. It's not true. Because why else would God put this verse in the Bible, be not bitter against them? You know, those of us who are married know what that means, okay? <laughs> we understand what it means when God said, be not bitter against them. And wives know what that means, not to be bitter, okay? To forgive, to let things go. But people who've never been married, they might not know what that means. Because their head is so far in the rock and roll music and all the TV and the movies, they live in a, in a false reality. Now look, my wife and I have a great relationship. I love being with my wife. My wife and I spend a lot of time, yeah, I've known a lot of people that are married, and they don't really spend a whole lot of time with their spouse. They just kind of have a date like once a week, and just kind of, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and we'll get along great, because we'll just, you know, hang around every once in a while together. You know, my wife and I are very close. We talk a lot, we spend a lot of time together, but because of that closeness, sometimes there are going to be times where you get on somebody's nerves, or where, where you get in a fight, or where you have a problem. And so the key is not to say, well, we're never going to sin. We're never going to commit sin. We're never going to do anything wrong. We're going to be perfect. That's a dumb goal, because you can't reach it, because you're a sinner. There's none righteous, no, not one. A better goal is to say, you know what? There will be problems, but you know what? I'm going to forgive. When my wife does wrong to me, I'm going to forgive. When I do wrong to my wife, I hope she'll forgive. And we can move on and have a loving, good relationship. At least, aren't you glad that God moves on? Aren't you glad that God's not still mad at you for something you did two years ago? Aren't you glad that when you get to heaven and stand before God as a believer in Jesus Christ, your sins are washed away? Aren't you glad that when you stand before God, He's not going to run through all your sins with you? But they're already separated from you as far as the east is from the west? So why would you bring up stuff that your wife did, you know, years ago, months ago, days ago? Why would you bring up stuff that your husband did? Why wouldn't you have the same forgiveness and say, hey, if Christ can forgive us, I, we can forgive each other. We can move on. That's the best advice that God gives here, I think, when he says, don't be bitter. Forgive. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, he said. But look back at you. I want to show you that in Colossians. But get back in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to finish this passage up. So what have we learned so far? Review. He said, hey, wives, submit to your husband. How much? How much do I submit? A little bit? Well, how much should the church submit to Christ? Okay, well, that's how much the wife should submit to her husband. And then he said, well, how much? Okay, husbands love your wives. Well, how much am I supposed to love her? Well, how much did Jesus love the guy who beat him and spat on him and nailed him to the cross? And he turned around and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's how little you're supposed to be bitter against your wife. That's how much you're supposed to love her and forgive her. And, and you ought to cherish her and nourish her. What does nourishment mean? Sounds like food. Right? Feed your wife. You know, and this is the key to a good marriage, guys. You gotta feed her. Right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But he's you know, nourish her. I'm just I'm just teasing. But you know, you ought to be nourished. You gotta pay the bills. You gotta provide. You gotta nourish and cher what does cherish mean? Cherish is loving, it's it's kindness, it's gentleness, it's compassion. So he said, nourish your wife, cherish your wife, that's feed your wife, love your wife, take care of your wife, and he said, uh, you know, basically forgive your wife, love your wife, be good to your wife. But let's keep reading. He said in verse number uh, 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Then he kind of basically sums it up in verse 33. This is kind of just the summary statement at the end. He says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. He said, you know, love thy, just like he said, love thy neighbor as thyself. And he says, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So what is the wife basically looking for from her husband according to this verse? She's looking for her husband to love her. And what is the man looking for from his wife? Reverence, respect. A man wants to be respected. It says, see that the wife reverence her husband. Now today we live in a time where women do not have respect for their husband. Children do not respect their parents. Employees do not respect the boss at work. Because we basically live in a society where people just don't respect any kind of authority at all. They don't respect the law. They don't respect a parent. They don't respect 
a, a husband, they don't respect a boss at work, they don't respect the, the owner of the company, and it's wrong, because God commands us to respect authority. And he says here, see that the wife reverence her husband. Today, children do not obey their parents. Look at the next verse, right after that he says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 6, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. My sister went to the doctor's office the other day in Fort Worth, Texas. And she's sitting in a doctor's office, and there's a, the, the pediatrician that she goes to, you know, this pediatrician tells them, and this is the way doctors are now. They're not just doctors. They, like, tell you how to live your life. They ask you if you have guns in your house. Uh, my, my, my sister's doctor is asking her husband, you know, do you have any guns? Where do you keep the guns? He's asked him all these different questions about his personal life. And my sister told me that when your kids get to a certain age, this pediatrician that she takes them to sits them down and explains to you, do not spank your children, you're hurting their psyche, you can't spank, you know, do timeouts. And she's like teaching parenting. I guess because it's a doctor, they know how to parent your child. And they're going to tell you, contrary to God's word, which God's word says that the rod and reproof give wisdom. It says, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. It says, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. The Bible says to beat your child with the rod. You say, oh, I can't, that's what the Bible says. Read the book of Proverbs. It says it repeatedly. Beat the child with the rod. That's what it says. It's the Bible. Okay? And people will say, oh, no, don't spank. You're going to hurt the child's sake. Well, let me tell you the story. So my, my sister's sitting in this doctor's office waiting room, and this lady's there, and she's got a very small child, like a toddler, and then she's got a son who was about nine years old, and this nine-year-old son is sitting against the wall like this, and he's basically got a video game, and uh, what it was, though, was the cell phone. You know how on the cell phone you can download a video game? So he's playing a video game on his mother's cell phone, and so he's sitting there playing a the video game, playing a video game. Well... This lady, you know, she, she talks to the, the lady behind the counter, the reception desk, the doctor, and the lady behind the reception desk says, well, um, you know, your insurance, there's a problem because the new child has not been added to the insurance, so you're going to have to make some phone calls and so forth. So basically this lady needs to make a phone call. So she says to the eight-year-old child, she says, I need to use the phone now because I have to make this call about the insurance. And the kid says, no. And she says, look, I need to call. You know, I need to make this call. You know, this and that. And he's like, no. Argh. You know, she tried to take it from time. Yanks it away. Well, finally, she takes the phone. And listen, this, this story is, is as true as the day is long. And, and it's, it was unbelievable. My sister said, I've never seen anything like this. This was just about a week ago. The child began to beat his mother in the face, literally. He started to slap her. He started punching her in the face. I mean, literally. And it was to the point where literally there were marks on her face. I mean, it wasn't just a little... I mean, he was pummeling his mother. I mean, he was punching her, slapping her, she's saying, stop, stop, don't do that. And she started bawling and crying. And this child was literally beating his mother's face in. And I mean, she was all red. She had finger marks and, 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 and marks from being beat up. And everybody in the waiting room was just looking on in, in horror. Okay? And finally... You know, finally what happened was that the nurse comes out and, and, and basically says, you know, you need to go sit in this other room and this and that. You know, because the nurse was just embarrassed that this was even happening. And then, I mean, it was, it was to the point where my, my sister almost wondered, like, are the police going to be called? Just because this, this kid had, like, beaten up his mom so bad. It was weird. It was strange. And uh, basically, finally, what happened was, you know, they're crying and they're moved into another room. And then the dad shows up and, and takes the boy. And, and, you know, takes him off and do it. This is the society we're living in. And, and, and as soon as my sister gets seen by the nurse, the nurse is saying, man, somebody needs to spank that kid. They're saying, sorry. You know, this is the one where they tell you, like, oh, don't spank, this and that. They're all singing a different tune now. They're saying, man, I, you know, I would have spanked that kid. That kid needed to be spanked. That kid needed a beating. I mean, give me a break. That kid is, is out of control. But let me tell you something. If you spare the rod, the Bible says this. And remember, this is God's word. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And so these parents, you say, oh, I love them too much to spank. No, you don't love them at all, according to the Bible, if you don't spank your children. Yes, I said that. If you don't spank the child, you don't love the child. You love yourself 
more than you love your child. Because you want them to like you or, or you want to be the, oh, you're too loving to spank. No, you're not loving enough to spank because that child's not happy. He's going to grow up and probably be a criminal. Who, God knows what he's going to be when he grows up because he's never had any boundaries. He's never had anybody love him enough to correct it. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son and we receive it. God loves us, therefore he disciplines us and we ought to discipline our children but today we have children have so little disrespect, they have so little respect for their parents that they would literally beat their mother. She won't, she won't spank him, but he'll spank her. And you know, I'd rather spank my child than be spanked by my child. <laughs> and you know, it sounds funny, but you know what? It's it's pretty sad when you're getting spanked. For, and it was it was sad. I mean, my sister felt bad, and she tried to talk to the ladies. She tried to give her the gospel. She wanted to talk to her and and, and talk, get her saved. And also, just she told her, she said, "Look, you know, you gotta spank your kid." I mean, she explained this to this lady. You got, you can't just let your child just beat you up. You know, I mean, it's, but that's the extreme day. And I've seen it. I've seen it in the store. Kids throwing themselves on the ground, screaming for, and, and nobody, nobody does anything about it. Johnny, Johnny, that's not nice. Do you want a popsicle later? <laughs> Good night. My, pa my pastor in California, this is what he used to say to people in public. He'd tell them, give him what he wants or give him what he needs. <laughs> you know, but, like, I, but I don't want to listen to him. You know what I mean? like, either give him what he wants or give him what he needs. That's what he used to tell people. That's true. But today we're living in this topsy-turvy world where the child spanks the parent. The, wife, the, the husbands are our reverence of the wife. They're scared of their wife in many cases. You, you, you try to tell them, hey, you know, let's, we're going to do this. What should we do? Well, you know, let me go out. Let me call the boss. They're like, what? And then they're calling their wife. And they literally say that. Who's ever heard somebody say that? Well, I'm going to call the boss. And they call their wife. Are you even a man? What's wrong with you? Why don't you, why don't you just stop calling yourself a man? Why don't you go move to California and, and you can use one of those restrooms that has both pictures on the outside where it has the male and female restroom? Why don't you use the family restroom, okay? You, you know, be a man. How can you call yourself a man and you're in submission to your wife? Hey, the Bible says that's what a woman's supposed to do. Why don't you be a man and be in charge in your home and not live in fear of your wife? No, it's wrong. And you say, well, it's, it's our society. We've changed. Yes, we've changed for the worse. And children don't care what their parents say. Wives don't care what their husbands say. Employees don't care what the boss says. It's just a disrespectful society that we live in. Because everybody just thinks that anything goes. Well, anything doesn't go in my house. And anything doesn't go in God's word. And so we need to get off this modernistic stuff and get back to what the Bible clearly says. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, in case you don't believe me. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And by the way, you say, oh, this is degrading to women. Is it degrading to children that they have to obey their parents? No. It's just the natural order of things that God established. And why is it degrading to women that they have to obey and submit to their husband? Because the Bible does say to obey. It says in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in uh, Titus chapter 2, it says that they may teach the young women to be sober. That's a good place. That's always a good place to start as a young woman. Be sober. That means get off the drugs, get off the alcohol, uh, be serious. He says to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Because God says that the word of God will be blasphemed because of Christian women who are not obedient to their husbands. That's what he said. He said women need to be obedient to their husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And 1 Peter chapter 3 is not something that you're going to hear preached in most churches. But yet there it is in the Bible. Look at verse 1. It says, Likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be come won by the conversation of the wise, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, 
even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So what's the opposite of a woman having a meek and quiet spirit? Proud and loud. That would be the opposite of meekness, would be pride, arrogancy, haughtiness. What's the opposite of quiet? This is a hard one. Isaac, what's the opposite of quiet? Loud. See, this isn't that hard to understand. He's not even married yet. He, he's got this figured out. It says, uh, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. So this is not a degrading thing, is it? He says, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. That's what the Bible says. Now, honey, why don't you come up here right now, honey? We're going to do an illustration here. Come on up here, honey. Because the Bible says here that the wife is the weaker vessel. Okay? Come on up here, honey. We're going to see if this is really true. Because so many people today are questioning the Bible. And especially they question the Bible on this subject of marriage. And on this subject of the roles of men and women in society, they question the Bible. So we're going we're to settle this right now. Okay? I want to know. And this, okay, fine. Left hand. You know, you choose your hand, honey. No, wait a minute. We're going to do this. Now look, I want to see whether the Bible is really true. Is the woman the weaker vessel, okay? Yeah, that wasn't that hard, folks. Now, I challenge any woman in this room right now. Brianne, come on up. <laughs> I'll challenge any woman. You want to challenge me? Wait, I saw that. Come on up here. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> Are you like one of these people who pretends like they don't know and then they gamble and they win? Alright, ready? Somebody call, go. Go, go. Yeah! Oh, yeah! See? Alright, go ahead and sit down. Alright, sit down. It's only physical. So basically, what's the Bible say? The weaker vessel. Oh, oh, oh. We just proved it. That's the strongest woman in this church. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, the point is that the Bible teaches here there is a difference between men and women. Do the men and women compete together in the Olympics? No, there's a physical difference. Okay? But you know, there's not just a physical difference. There is an emotional difference between men and women. Men and women have different emotions. Men and women have different talents and abilities. Men have certain talents and abilities. Women have other talents and abilities that are different. Men have different strengths in certain areas. Women have different strengths in other areas. There's a difference. It's not that she's less honorable, but it's that she's the weaker vessel and therefore is subject unto the husband. That's what the Bible says. And then, uh, did I read the whole thing there? Or is there one more verse? I think that's it. It says, And ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vestal, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Look over, if you would, at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. He says in uh, 1 Timothy 2, just go back a few pages in your Bible toward the beginning. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy